Okay, hi everybody. Good morning to you all. It's good evening for me here in the Philippines. I want to thank uh, Innova Media Lab, especially Paolo and Katarina for inviting me here to be part of this series. Um, it's almost the weekend if we count Thursday as almost the weekend and I'm sure and assume that most of us here will watch Netflix in over tomorrow or you know over the weekend. So can I ask our audience today to share what they are currently watching on Netflix? You know, what do you recommend for other people in the room that to watch over the weekend, to binge, or you know, maybe watch more slowly, whatever your your, your rhythm is? I wanna see in the chat your recommendations of what you're watching. Better Call Saul, German TV show Dark. I love Dark. I've been watching the show before. Stranger Things, yes, season four. Yeah, season four of Stranger Things will be back tomorrow. Yeah. Other recommendations? Yeah, what else are you going to watch? It may be, you know, old reruns, could be new releases, and even um, content that were just uh, recently, I guess, bought by Netflix or, you know, are rented by Netflix to be distributed in their platform. All right, so okay, the last one recommendation is want to see the latest Jim Jarmusch movie, Gilmore Girls. I quit Netflix a year ago, but will write my PhD on this platform. Better probably signing up again, The Witcher, Borgen. Okay, I love that this audience uh, today actually watches a lot of Netflix, and I am an avid Netflix watcher as well. So essentially what we're doing now is recommending content, right? And it's the same thing that the Netflix recommender system does, the algorithm, in other words. Except that the way it's doing it is using data, code, and other complex computational processes that are not accessible nor understandable to most of us. Even programmers might have a hard time understanding how the algorithm works. So in today's masterclass, I wish to share my attempt at demystifying how the Netflix algorithm works and illuminate how algorithms shape our everyday cultural experiences, specifically in the context of you know, audiovisual culture and cinema. So my confession to make before anything else is that I have a love-hate relationship with Netflix. I realize that Netflix recommendations are equally either a hit or a miss. Sometimes you think this recommendation is really for me, Netflix really gets me. Other times, I don't get the recommendations at all. It makes me question if Netflix really knows my taste and also how it defines taste to begin with. What is it? What's the object that, it make, that makes all this decision happen in our interfaces? So for my graduate research, I wanted to answer this question. How does the Netflix recommender system construct cultural taste? First, what are its assumptions about taste? Second, what processes are involved in generating recommendations? And lastly, does the Netflix recommender system tell us uh, about something about the algorithm as an intermediary in contemporary culture? So we know that Netflix is a pioneer uh, in the streaming wars, so-called streaming wars, and is in fact the world's largest streaming platforms with over 214 million users as of, you know, the latest data. The last time I did the presentation about this was just 200. I think the pandemic accelerated this number. Um, recent news really says that the new membership, though, is declining because maybe there's more streaming competition happening. But despite the competition with HBO Max, with Hulu, with Disney+, Plus, Netflix distinction is its recommender system. Which is, its, which is a set of algorithms designed to provide personalized recommendations for individual users. How exactly the algorithms work is unknown to us because it's a black box that's often the metaphor used to describe it, kept as a trade secret by Netflix. So like any other big tech company, Facebook or Google, the algorithms are their secret sauce that makes them competitive in the market. However, there are things that we know of the Netflix recommender system because they are encapsulated in what we call as streaming lores or, you know, or, or like folklores, right? Or narratives that are built by the industry about its algorithm, such as the Netflix algorithm generating quality recommendations suited to your taste. It was able to deconstruct 
genres and demographic groups such as algorithms, such that algorithms are actually blind of race, of gender, and sexual orientation. And that's what they claim. And ultimately, the, the, the main promise is that the algorithms are objective and that it only relies on the data you give it to, to give the algorithm to recommend to you what you should watch next. All of this narratives fortify the mythology of an all-powerful algorithm who knows you and your interests and perhaps even your future tastes. And this is where it creates a dissonance for me because yes, the algorithm is so great, but it makes mistakes and lapses in judgment when it recommends to me and maybe to you as well. Maybe raise hands here if you have you know, weird recommendations from your algorithm. So the biggest question here is how do I reconcile this big all-knowing narrative of the algorithm to my own imperfect experience? I saw the answer in the materiality of the NRS. So let's call it NRS from now since it's a mouthful um, and it's algorithms. Algorithms are simply defined as a set of mathematical procedures whose purpose is to expose some truth or tendency about the world. It's not making up things. It is you know, presenting a version of a world that's you know, based in data and numbers and, and, and whatnot. Think about it as a set of instruction, a blueprint, a recipe that aims to simulate reality or at least a part of it. Even if it sounds straightforward, you know, algorithms are just like that computing numbers into, you know, realities. Um, scholars argue that algorithms are in fact opaque, messy, and hidden in sight. It is, a form, it is often in the form of code when you talk about algorithms, you know, it's the realm of the programmers, of the coders, and not, you know, scholars and students and ordinary people like us. And that code is concealed given the proprietary nature of the algorithm. It is, you know, trademark Netflix algorithm. Algorithms are also created by humans, but when they apply machine learning or ML, which simply means that it changes its operations as it learns more things, it gets more data, it's not quite unclear who decides the recommendation. Is it still the programmer or is it the, or is, is it the machine already or maybe the user? Now, the important thing to remember also about algorithms is that they are recursive. What this means is that it operates in a loop. And it is hard to know where the algorithm begins and ends. And that makes them both the producer of culture and the product of culture itself. So all of these characteristics render the algorithms a kind of power that does not work over the system, but within the system. Scott Lash calls this power as post-hegemonic. So if you're familiar with the word hegemon, right, it works top down. It's post-hegemonic because it doesn't work through ideology like neoliberalism or patriarchy, but through the structures that's happening within our environment that govern our day-to-day -day processes. Because algorithms surround us and it is invisible and it, yet it regulates you know, big parts of our, of our lives, like in, in Netflix, for instance, what content gets to be seen on top of the interface, how it goes around the platform, how it's valued and like mechanisms like trending titles, for instance. Those are the things that the algorithm decide on a day-to-day -day logistical basis. As we share more of who we are to algorithms, so do they construct a data version of us in the back end of the algorithm and project, us, uh, project it back to us in the form of recommendations. So while algorithms are you know, elusive objects, it is also a cultural object that the policymakers deliberate on, that the media always talk about, like this, um, this headline in, in the slide. And even ourselves, we talk about the algorithms every day. We tweet about it. We talk about it over lunch, you know, maybe Zoom lunch. Um, the other side, this other side of the algorithm is quite public, even if the other side is, you know, secret. And that made me realize that there is a way to study the Netflix algorithm, because I want to focus on something that's already out there, not something hidden in code. So in my study, I exploited this visible aspect of the Netflix recommender system in social life to unknow the algorithm. I don't need to know programming code to understand how it works, because there are manifestations of it in real life. Algorithms are not a black box. It's not black. It's not a box. It's in fact 
the Netflix recommender system by investigating technical documents explaining how it works because Netflix blogs about it, scavenging for social posts about the NRS, especially during the times it fails users or it breaks down. And lastly, um, I would want to contextualize how the NRS is configured uh, as a coherent socio-technical apparatus to the media, to the public sphere of how we think and perceive about the algorithm. And here is what I found. What I found is that the algorithm engages in three algorithmic processes, which I labeled as extraction, appraisal, and prediction. So let's get to it one by one. Extraction is when the algorithm identifies the signals, actions, and even traces of information that indicates user taste preferences. The NRS categorizes this data as explicit taste preference, and the other one is implicit taste preference. So explicit tastes are users directly informing the algorithm of the things they like. If you are an early Netflix user, you might remember Netflix having a star system, you know, the five star system we're all familiar with. But it changed to a thumbs up and down system recently because they said they want people to be honest and embrace their guilty pleasures instead of being burdened by rating, you know, a film uh, based on stars because that, that, that metric of rating films are for um, critically acclaimed movies and not for those who just wants to say, yeah, I like it. No, I don't like it. Now, that's explicit taste preference. You're directly telling the algorithm, I like this movie and or not. Implicit taste preference, meanwhile, are indirect consumption data when you watch shows, navigate the platform, do your searches. All of that behavior signals the algorithms of what you like. So you don't have to tell it directly. It, it picks up that signal. Now, the interesting part here is that these two taste preferences, the kinds of data that Netflix extract from our consumption, is not equal. In fact, um, it is the implicit taste preference that carries more value in the algorithm. Explicit taste preference, according to the executives of Netflix, are said to be aspirational or performative, but it's not a real taste, in other words. Implicit taste preference are the stronger predictor of what if we eventually watch on a lazy Friday night. Even if it's a trashy reality show or a sitcom we've watched multiple times, it's something that is predictive of our action instead of, you know, our aspirational explicit taste. So that's where uh, it comes, what's interesting about it. Even if you tell Netflix, no, I don't like this show, it might, you know, put less value in what you tell the algorithm because it's the behavior that matters to them. The next process is called appraisal which involves transforming the extracted data into forms that would allow the algorithms to categorize and evaluate that data to put you know, a value or, or you know, a, 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 um, a tag to it. One of the so-called invention of Netflix is to create thousands of new genre categories constructed by segmenting films and TV programs into inexhaustible granular components. These include things like the moral stance of the character, the degree of romance in a, in a sitcom, for instance, the level of gore in, in a horror film, all of which are graded in a scale. So it's very much complicated. Then it produces hyper-specific genres like the one in the slide, mind-bending cult horror movies from the 1980s visually striking cerebral fight the system movie. So it's very, very, very specific. And they are called alt genres. Now, the reason why Netflix purportedly did this is to repel what they call as genre bias so that people are more open to watching content without the associations or the baggage of the umbrella genre conventionally assigned to that kind of film. So we know about the tropes of superhero films. So what they do is also categorize a superhero film in romance or you know, horror, whatever works for them, as long as it, again, repels the genre bias we have. That's why the algorithms uh, created all these new genres in the form of alt genres. Maybe alt genres represent alternative genres. But you know, there's implication when we invoke the word alternative. Another category that Netflix invented um, 
is uh, called Taste Communities. So probably heard it from the previous speaker um, in the series. Instead of looking at demographics as the basis of the recommendation, so it's not about your race, your gender, or sexual orientation, Netflix created new groups of um, people or you know audiences on their so-called taste. Of course, I call so-called taste because again, how is taste constructed and you know quantified by the algorithm? The people in this group of taste communities are what they call as your taste doppelgangers because they share whatever taste you have, a combination of tastes you have. They could be wherever they are in the world. Those people who like anime in Japan could also be in the Philippines or in Portugal. So it doesn't matter where the hell you live, who you are, what your skin color is, how it's your socioeconomic class. The algorithm supposedly generates and uses these taste communities to derive new recommendations to these people, even if they're not really sharing any demographic detail, as long as they share the same taste tendencies. So how many taste communities are there? I'm not sure. It's not said in public. Some report says that taste communities are about 4,000 and that one user can belong to three to four communities. So that's what we have in our data. Apart from new categories, algorithms weigh the potential of recommendation based on a set of criteria. It is again quite vague and undisclosed, but what we know for sure as the constant criteria they use to appraise um, recommendation would be the relevance of the title of the user stays, so if it fits your, you know, your interest, and the popularity of a title across particular periods of time or geographic location. So the, these two um, criteria, popularity and relevance, are the one that is constant. However, Netflix also recognizes that it wants to introduce diversity, and that's what they call it, diversity, to make sure that people see a wide range of options for you. But later on, you know, um, as a spoiler, you'll see that, you know, that diversity is used quite loosely. Um, then, apart from the criteria that's quite again, ambiguous, there's also what they call as A-B testing. So this is essentially a process um, that is familiar to people who might know marketing or digital advertising, but basically you experiment with variants of different photos, different titles, and recommend it to control groups to different groups of audiences and see which ones are the most clickable. So here in this example, even if you are recommending the same show to you know, different uh, geographic location, different audiences, the way it is recommended to you will be different depending on you know, the historical taste data they have on you because of those appraisal factors I've mentioned. Now, we're done with extracting the data. We're now converting it to a form that makes sense to the algorithm through appraisal. Now, the last process is called prediction, which is finally presenting the recommendations to viewers. In Netflix, everything is a recommendation because even the manner of how it's recommended to you is personalized, and that's what they claim. So your homepage, for example, is customized by positioning specific title in, in specific ranking, designating rows for which genres appeal to you, even creating thematic rows for special recommendation. So in this interface, for example, the top row indicates shows common to what this viewer has seen in the last weeks. Then there is also a trending row, which is supposedly still personalized. It's trending, but it's personalized. So there's that conflict there as well. And specific rows that recommend based on your recent um, watches or any other special category. So all of these are unique to you, supposedly. In each recommended title, the artwork or thumbnail presented to you is also personalized. So in this example, so speaking of Stranger Things season four, for those interested in watching sci-fi in general, you know, you might want uh, to see Stranger Things. You might be presented with the poster that frames Stranger Things as sci-fi. So yeah, makes sense. But um, it could also be presented to viewers who like romance. So if you see the artwork here, 
um, in the bottom middle image with Nancy and Jonathan, you know, it could look like romance. Uh, it could also look like a period film. It could also look like, I don't know, a horror story. So whatever uh, genre works for you, the, the thing is they would still recommend the same title, Stranger Things. So there's that. Lastly, is the match score. So the match score is a percentage you see that indicates how compatible the title is to your taste. So some reports I've seen indicate that whenever there's a title that is lower than 50 in your match score, it doesn't appear in your interface at all. So even if supposedly Netflix has a lot of titles, thousands of titles in its library, it won't all be visible to you if it eliminated already those with less, you know, match for, uh, for you. So there are a lot of these moving parts, a lot of criteria, factors that um, computes into the recommendations. Now, I want to move on uh, to, you know, think about this processes, not as a rational and logical processes, because it seems like they want to project the algorithm as an objective, you know, uh, arbiter of your taste. You know, it's based on data. It's all based on experiments of what works, what you like, your historical data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, my investigation reveals inconsistencies and discrepancies in how the NRS are experienced by users. And I do experience this myself. Maybe you know you can share your experiences as well in the chat that I can read through a little bit later. I'm just catch. Tissue. Okay. Okay. So one of the major controversies around the algorithm of Netflix is that despite supposedly being post-demographic, you know, it's blind of race, gender, or um, sexual orientation, reports of racial and gender targeting made waves in media a couple of years back. So the first case was about an African about African American users allegedly being targeted with posters featuring minor black characters in films with predominantly white cast. So it's you know a white film basically, but with you know sprinkles of uh, African American characters. Now these posters were used to target black users, and these users were quite outraged, really insulted by supposedly reducing them to the race. Uh, they thought, hey, you know, I'm a whole person. I have, you know, diverse tastes. But because I am Black, I'm being targeted with this movie, with this minor Black character in the artwork. And somehow it manufactures diversity where there isn't really a lot, right? By, by, by targeting them based on race. The second case was about the alleged algorithmic rearrangement of the episode for the anthology Love, Sex, and Robot. So this is, again, uh, there's a recent release of this. I think Love, Death, and Robot is the title of that. Um, in this case, it's an, it's an anthology. So it's not, you know, uh, sequen uh, sequential. So whatever is served to you, it doesn't matter what was the first thing you watch. Some queer users on uh, Twitter, and this was reported later on by The Guardian, by New York Times, reported that they were served with the lesbian, explicitly lesbian episode uh, and compared their interface with their cisgender friends and saw that their cisgender friends were served with the hetero episode on the top of the recommendation instead of the, you know, the queer episode. So they were saying that, you know, there's this, you know, gender targeting happening here. In our Twitter data, we've seen similar accounts. For example, there were tweets about, you know, Netflix thought I was white. They were serving me white films. Or Netflix was queer baiting me, giving me images of two guys dating or kissing, for instance. So in these cases of racial and gender targeting, of course, you know, the algorithm again is at fault here. And what Netflix would say and have said is that we deny the allegation that we are deliberately targeting based on race and sexual orientation because, again, the algorithm does this. It's not us. It's the algorithm. It's computed. It's randomly assigned. It's not something that we deliberately did. Um, so that's that's one of the key issues here. That's, you know, dissonant to what the algorithm claims to be. Another issue about algorithmic personalization is misrepresentation. 
So for the show, Grace and Frankie, anyone watching this show, uh, I think it re recently finished. Um, Engineers at Netflix recommends removing the artwork of actress Jane Fonda. So she's one of the stars of the show because it wasn't generating conversions. By conversions, what they mean is that people click on it, but they don't watch. So reports indicate that this might be the pol because of the polarized view about Jane Fonda. She was an activist during the height of the Vietnam War. Now she's you know an activist again for climate justice. So they were saying they're not clicking on Jane Fonda's photo for Grace and Frankie, even if she's the star of the show, because of that polarizing view. Another controversy was about the show Nailed It. So... If anyone is watching Nailed It, basically, I think there's a lot of Nailed It franchise already. It's a sh baking show um, for non-bakers, essentially. Um, viewers report that they were targeted with artwork featuring the two white male supporting hosts. So the chef and one of like the, the staff. But the artwork of the host, a black woman named Nicole Byer, so he, she's quite popular, now uh, wasn't showing up at all in their interfaces. She said in a deleted tweet, I think she was really hurt by this, um, that this is you know, a deliberate erasure of Black women in public spaces. And it's a cheap tactic to sell the show. But later on, according to her, the Netflix executive explained how the algorithm works and that you know she accepted, yeah, maybe it's just a product of machine error or what, what not. It's not uh, something that, again, is deliberate. Apart from looking at media reports, I also analyze global conversations about Netflix algorithm. And our Twitter data suggests a consistent tendency to target based on demographic. But some other tweets reveal interesting observations too. So here, uh, one of the observations is that there are odd connections between your viewing history and the recommendation. So let me read the tweet. Netflix to just told me that based on my recent viewing, I might enjoy Ted Bundy thing. So it's a true crime um, documentary or uh, I think a reenactment. Um, but I've been binge watching Shit's Creek and Kim's Convenience. So it's a it's both sitcom, comedy sitcom. So the user feel like, why is it recommending something of a true crime you know, narrative or a show to me when I've been watching comedy sitcoms all this time? Um, Another complaint that's common, of course, these are exemplar in, in my data. There's recurring you know, tweets about this. Uh, there's also the concern that the algorithm is misreading your taste. I need to have a conversation with the Netflix algorithm. I watch period drama a lot. I love K-drama a lot, but still, I hate most rom-com a lot. Please stop recommending stuff with the word date or affair in the title. So there's that, you know, uh, resentment by the user that the algorithm is not getting, you know, um, uh, the taste uh, that it's, it's, it's trying to send um, uh, by, the, by the user to the algorithm. There's also complaint about some titles being buried by the algorithm. And I quote this because it's exactly the word used by um, the, the tweet. Um, the show one day at the time, if you're familiar with it, it's a Latina show. Um, it was nowhere to be found on my Netflix homepage. I've seen all the previous seasons. So what kind of crappy algorithm hides the new episodes from me and make me search? I'm offended. So it's weird because if you've been watching a show, you expect it to, you know, appear in your recommendation once it has new episodes, but it's not. So there's that, you know, that's again, dissonance or inconsistency. And of course, this is the common critique. It's prioritizing, allegedly, the Netflix originals. Please give us back the old algorithm that recommended shows based on what we watch and stop fixing us to watch Netflix originals. All of these accounts challenge this coherent narrative portrayed by the Netflix algorithm and illustrates a more complex construction of taste by the algorithm. So there. So that's my empirical evidence at this point. And what I want to really give you and you know, as a takeaway for this masterclass or lecture is that the NRS employs logics that constitute its construction of taste within its infrastructure. So these logics, these four uh, words here are not exhaustive. There might be other ones, but at least these were the ones um, that I analyzed from my data. 
The first logic is datafication, which pertains to the process of translating taste into data. In the process of quantifying taste, certain assumptions are animated. First, taste is seen as something you can divide into thousands and millions of parts. In Netflix paradigm, your taste is divisible. This is problematic because your taste is more than the sum of its parts. And what makes it distinct is its inseparable nature and to your curiosities, interests, and aspirations. What also happens when you splice and dice taste or content is that you take it out of context. You take it away from the person who supposedly owns that taste. And by reducing you as a user into data points or maybe the, the film or TV show into data points, you cede control of your taste and the algorithms have a free hand to decide whatever it is that, to make out of the quantified version of yourself in the algorithm's back end. So the logic of datafication is so pervasive that no digital or computational system could operate without first generating data version of the information it collects. So whatever it collects from us, it's still raw and it needs to be datafied to be able to be um, readable to the algorithm. The second logic I want to share with you is called reconfiguration. So the algorithm has now millions of data to combine and reconfigure to create new compositions and categories like all genres or taste communities. Well, this could be good because it reorients us to the conventional categories and models of the world. Maybe, you know, something new to explore that would, you know, be an alternative schema to how we learn culture, how we, you know, experience cinema. It only reestablishes biases around race, gender, and sexual orientation according to our data. Scholars have argued that this imprinting of dominant structure in the algorithm is a product of prejudices of the creators of the algorithm and the data that is used to train it. What I want to emphasize here as well is that the criteria and metrics of the algorithm you, that, that, that it uses also privilege the mainstream somehow. And your options could appear diverse, you know, but it's a diverse set of mainstream choices. And it really disadvantages minority stories and culture. So in this logic of reconfiguration, whatever fits or doesn't fit, the prevailing model of the algorithm are ignored or neglected. And, you know, the finer nuances of taste and cultural identity is, you know, a non-issue for them. So if you're a person who has, you know, a wide range of taste, because there's only four taste community, it can only, you know, put you in that four boxes and not beyond that. Okay, so the third logic is called interpolation. So for scholars, students in the room, probably familiar because I borrowed it from the philosopher Louis Althusser, the new categories and models created out of reconfiguration would only make sense if it calls us to identify with them. In the recommendation, they use semantics, imagery, and even space, you know, how things are arranged to hail us into associating our identities with them. Posters of dating shows featuring the same featuring same-sex couples are used to call you know queer viewers to identify uh, into that identity. And it's the same way if you're a Taylor Swift fan or your K-drama fan, it's the same thing. It's interpolating your identity. Why this interpolation works so well is because we have some sense of ownership over what would appear in the recommendation. We see it as categorized uh, images of ourselves, and we are keen to correct the algorithm when it reads us the wrong way. This strong rhetoric of Netflix, uh, you know, personalized profile further reinforces that, you know, you should internalize what recommendations are being given to you. So all of these makes a subject of the algorithm and lends it, lends it control over us. Now, the last logic I want to share uh, to everyone, and I think it's the most important uh, for people in the industry and in, in the scholarly field, is the logic of reproduction. So if you remember at the beginning of a discussion, algorithms are recursive and they are producing and reproducing perpetually. This means that it's constantly generating and engaging cultural experience. The way they do it is to create new cultural forms, not by creating something brand new, but through repackaging, reframing, and reassembling data and content. 
making you believe that a romance that it's you know a film is a romance even if it's primarily sci-fi making you believe it's a good movie even if it's not good you know these affect your choices and what you'll watch for that day or that night and i know it seems so minor but the choices collectively created or generated by people or audiences affect the prospect of that show being watched again, being recommended, or even being extended for another season or being canceled, right? So it does matter where, you know, what this new cultural form looks like. So key to reproduction as a logic is also manufacturing cultural standards. By defining what is popular or what matches your taste, it sharpens or it shapes our norms and expectations of what is popular what what you know what's what's a good tv show and you rarely question what's the basis of this you know standard to begin with and lastly what is critical here as users um, we are presented with choices right you know you can scroll and scroll and have thousands of options but these choices become constraints when the algorithm restricts us or even dismiss our decision when we negotiate our algorithmic identity with it so we have the option to say, no, I don't like this film, but sometimes it ignores it because it's it, what, what, what matters is the implicit uh, day signals, for instance. So that's, you know, the, the conflict there. We tell the algorithm what we want and it, igno it ignores us most of the time. So I'm already in the conclusion. I'm five minutes over time. So what can we take away from this critical analysis of the NRS? Algorithms are powerful not only because of their computational power, it feels amazing, it's a machine, it's AI, but it's also because of their logistical power to structure our perception, our choices, and our reality. The algorithmic logics I presented here illustrate how algorithms can be self-generative of its own assumptions and models, despite the belief that we feed our data to them, and therefore we, as users, can influence them. More importantly, it is the narrative of algorithms that makes them deflect criticism or lead us to believe that we can control the algorithm somehow. This just emphasizes the perspective that these social technical machines are in fact culturally constructed as well. And we need not only to look at the code or you know, the technical aspect of things, but also the context of encoding. So the code, the encoding context where al algorithms actually come to life and we perceive and you know, actually have materialized what it looks like in everyday um, life. So that's it for, for my presentation, the article for this uh, topic is out. So I will share later on um, in our chat box so you can take a look. Um, thank you so much.